it should come as no surprise to most listeners when I say that I am a fan of Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi's presidential run has been riddled with controversy because she speaks out against the military-industrial complex and the corruption of the DNC. Not only that, but she relaxed parking laws in Hawaii for food truck. That is amazing. Parking laws shouldn't even exist, so someone finally fighting back against big parking is a win in my book. I mean, elect, elect this woman right now. You know, free parking for all. That's, that's what I want to see more candidates talk about. One of her controversies involve India. Tulsi is a practicing Hindu, and there are claims of her being connected to the right wing of Hindu politics. She's deemed as an agent of Hindu nationalism, uh, amongst other things. But how true is it? And do we in the United States have an understanding of what the right wing of Indian politics really is? This week, we're going to dive into the recent election victory of Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. Modi has been and continues to be the Prime Minister of India since 2014. He's part of the conservative Hindu party, the Bharatiya Janta Party, or the BJP. The BJP is the political wing of the Rajeshtriya Swayamsevak Sangh, or the RSS. The RSS is a non-political volunteer Hindu nationalist organization that pushes the idea that India is a Hindu nation. The RSS is pretty much the BJP's sugar daddy that makes you feel guilty for eating too much of their sugar. Modi ran an anti-corruption campaign, like most populists do. The opposition of the BJP is the Indian National Congress Party, spearheaded by Rahul Gandhi, who wasn't currying the favor of the Indian people. His grandmother was Indira Gandhi, probably one of the most powerful female leaders of our time. And his dad was Rajiv Gandhi, who was a unpopular prime minister. Both both of his family members were killed in the line of politics. I mean, at this point, the question to Mr. Rahul Gandhi would be, why would you run and put yourselves in the crosshairs? I mean, be anything else. Break the patterns of history and assassination by breaking the caste system and save your life. But people did lose faith in the Congress party when they didn't do much to help with the poverty problem in India. So the people of India voted in a different direction. Modi did also appeal to the people because he represented the idea of upward mobility. He started out as a working class man vending tea on the side of the road. He eventually became the chief minister, uh, or in American terms, the governor of the state of Gujarat. And in 2014, at the age of 63, he became the prime minister. Rahul Gandhi comes from a line of politicians who were in the upper caste. Rahul Gandhi was out of touch with the problems of the common man, while Modi was one of the commoners. He was nicknamed the Chokidar, or the Watchman for people. He embraced his lower caste position and vowed to use his power to equalize everyone. But the problems for Modi actually start when he was the CM of Gujarat. Modi made a speech that a terror attack in 2002 was possibly the fault of local Muslims, which led to riots that year. This led to the the death of a lot of people, mostly Muslim. Uh, The Indian Supreme Court did call him into trial for advocating for the violence that was seen during the riots, but he was released due to a lack of evidence and things being associated with a chain of reaction of events, which is basically the court saying, yeah, life happens. Well, in this case, life happened to kill a lot of people, which is like the opposite of life. Before all of this in the 70s, when Indira Gandhi enacted the emergency, a period of time where she ruled without opposition, Modi spearheaded the local contingent of the RSS to combat against a dictatorial act like that. 
When the RSS was banned, he was forced to go into the underground. And when he appeared in public, he would have to be disguised, right? Sometimes he was a monk. Sometimes he was a Sikh man. I mean, this is all pretty much fodder for a Bollywood film. And it does have a nice revolutionary ring to it. In terms of economics, Modi is actually pretty conservative. He reduced corporate taxes, eliminated wealth taxes, and deregulated diesel. All of this is very much in line with how America has operated and pushed trickle-down economics for years with mounting evidence that it won't work. This, paired with the decrease of funds for the Education for All program and social programs, Modi's policies didn't seem to, to really help the common people of India too much. Now, decreasing funds for educating Indians isn't particularly a pro-Hindu platform. It perpetuates and props up the white supremacist idea that brown people aren't smart. But, so far, this seems like he's in line with all of the Republicans and the Democrats that are secretly Republicans, which is like most of them. Modi also instated a new program called Make in India. This is a program where he wants more foreign companies to come into India and manufacture their goods in the country. This is why he needed to lower corporate tax rates. At least in India, it does seem like a large corporation would pay taxes. But the balance is the higher goods and services taxes. So products made in India would be taxed higher on the export. Math. It can be a beautiful thing. But with the growing talks about automation, all Modi is doing is a inviting a global robot initiative to make our shit. Okay, the future is going to be robots enslaved to move our consumerism forward. I think we should all be concerned about robot rights and what class they belong to. And eventually, we're going to have to have a dialogue about what genders these robots belong to and whether that's for us to decide. Right? Humanity needs to sort itself out real quick before these even more complex questions start coming up. I feel like the thought of transgendered robots will give most of the Republicans in office right now an aneurysm. The major thing that people are upset with Modi is the demonetization of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes in an attempt to fight terrorism, organized crime, and corruption. The problem is, because of the increased poverty in India, most of the country has a cash-based society. Nobody tell the IRS about this. But this meant that a lot of people in rural India and in the lower caste didn't have bank accounts to put these demonetized notes into in the short amount of time that they were given. So it perpetuated the pro poverty problem and didn't really stop the illegalities. It just gave those people a high interest savings accounts. That's what we really need. Right, organized crime with a responsible financial plan for 10 years with a great interest rate. Invest in disenfranchisement today, an FDIC member. In 2014, Modi instated a new health policy, which didn't increase government spending in health care, but rather partnered with private health care providers to fund a public option. Unfortunately, this decreased the funding to the public health care options by 20%. Eventually, he switched to a new plan called Ayushman Bharat or Healthy India. And this program was meant to cover over 500 million lower caste and poor Indian families to ensure their access to health care. That's more than the population of America. And right now, over 100,000 Indians have signed up for this as of 2018, October of 2018. Modi also worked on a sanitation plan for India. He built public toilets to decrease public urination and defecation. Okay, this needs to happen in like every bar district in India and America. India still has issues with sanitation, but programs like these 
um, that Modi has put into place will help reduce that. It would make the olfactory experience of India a little less mm, robust. And this is a very big deal. This would be incredibly beneficial in the states too. I mean, sure, there are rest areas, but in the cities, it would eliminate the restrooms are for customers only rule. And yes, to be fair, some of that comes from we the people taking advantage of small business owners and giving them the Starbucks treatment. You know, going into a Starbucks to looking a barista right in the eye and promising them your order of a caramel latte after you use the restroom only to ghost them, leaving them wondering what you would have even done with your drink. Modi also tried to get internet to rural areas in India. This would increase electronic manufacturing in India and would be covered in the GST. Now, this is a pretty incredible feat. I don't think there has been a a, a recorded time in our history where someone has tried to provide over a billion people with the internet. Okay, America sure hasn't, especially with the repeal of net neutrality. And unfortunately, done by an Indian person. Rural communities in America don't have great internet coverage, and this should be included as a basic human right. The internet is used for education, entertainment, pornography, and look, everybody needs it, okay? Everybody needs the internet at this point. At this point, India's internet connectivity and speed is a work in progress. Because of certain extremist groups, there are some things that are censored uh, on the internet in India. Some reports claim that there is haphazardness in what is being censored, but due to the increased freedom of sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, it might actually decrease the haphazardness. Although uh, the fear is that if sites like these are accessible in all countries, you know, will they determine the censorship of content on a global scale, creating a one world government technopoly? Look, there is a good chance that if the algorithms of YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter merge into one entity, it would create Ultron. And with how much we're defunding education right now, we might not have a Tony Stark for a very long time. Now, Let's get into the most troubling aspect of Modi's leadership, his connection to Hindu nationalism. The BJP and its parent company, the RSS, are both proponents of the Hindutva. This is the ideology that India is a country for the Hindus. This sort of ideology is not very different than what a lot of other countries have. Right, Israel is a country for Jewish people, and America claims to be a Christian nation. Now, India has a constitution, much like America's, that states freedom of practicing your religion. And India, much like America, is a republic that is based on secularism. But because of the national pride of Hindus in India, there has been an increase of violence towards Muslim preach it when you preach this sort of an ideology look india is a very religious country it's so religious that we have a god for everything right a god for money a god for rivers and mountains a god for pants america mostly just worships the almighty dollar it is not a coincidence that america's currency has photos of its past leaders and the word in god we trust right on the money Money is God in America, and the leaders were owned by it and and continue to be owned by it. The main religion in India is Hinduism, which is a very old religion that has evolved over time and moved all across the globe and is probably responsible for the popularity of yoga pants. And as we all know, yoga pants are responsible for the increase in people staring at women's butts in the last decade. Okay, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that is not one of the core beliefs of Hinduism. One of the core beliefs of Hinduism is that cows are the womb of the earth. So cows in India are sacred. In fact, that's where a lot of the violence against Muslims stems from. 
people have been attacked for using leather products and eating beef. There are cow vigilante groups all across India that are killing people, particularly Muslims, for eating beef. It's like the Avengers for cows, but with a lot more unnecessary murder. murder. Plus, Modi has spoken out against beef eaters and leather makers to appease to more Hindus. And there are cow protection laws in India, but no laws to protect violence against people of a certain or any faith. Modi even came out and spoke out against America's beef consumption. It would be interesting to see a wave of Hindutvas that came into America to tear down the oppression of the Burger King. Burger King's I don't give a fuck sandwich just found a large contingent of people that give all the fucks and they're here to tear things down. What these Hindutvas are doing is wrong. I mean, not just morally or humanitarianly, but also constitutionally. They're going against what their country is about. Not only that, when you make laws that protect people, well, protect animals, but not people, it shows a genuine lack of care for people that, is de that decided to worship differently than you. It doesn't make you an effective Chowkidar or Watchman. It makes you complicit in hatred. If more laws like the cow protection laws are passed in India without laws against violence towards people, India won't be a republic with a democracy, but a theocracy with little or no room to improve and progress, possibly overrun by livestock and, and robots. And yes, maybe even robot cows. Violence against people also goes against the tenets of Hinduism and also most other religions too. I mean, most religions fundamentally boil down to one thing, the golden rule. Treat each other the way you want to be treated. If this is the way Hindus in India want to be treated, then the retaliation is unfortunately going to be just. The issue with the Modi administration is that they've kind of been silent about the Muslim attacks. And as we've learned from American politics, silence is often the loudest thing you can say. The Hindutva ideology comes from fighting against the British Empire. It was about solidarity, and now it's being politicized by the RSS and the BJP for political gain. It was an ideology to prevent persecution of Hindus from the colonists. And in the 60s, that idea was used by the BJP again. But India has always been known as a majority Hindu country. And I don't think there was ever a point since its independence that Hindus have been persecuted there. There's been violence towards them, but the retaliation from the Hindus have been swift and exponential. Now, the same reasoning is being used because of the rise of secular thinking. The questioning of the superstitions of a religion that has led to the exploitation of hundreds and thousands of people is a danger to more conservative, traditionalist, power-hungry ideals. I think nationalism is seen as something positive in India, and it can be. Modi says that nationalism is what inspires him. And if we look at nationalism as pride in one's home, then it's not particularly as bad as we think it is. As long as, you know, you don't hurt someone because of your pride. But it can become bad when you let your pride piss in your eye and blind you from the fact that you're being pissed on. Look, if you have pride in your country, perhaps... Follow the guidelines that set up your freed country. That would probably be the most logical decision to make. That would mean that persecution based on religion is incorrect. And making India less multicultural and less diverse would be the least Hindu thing to do. Secularist ideas would actually help Modi achieve his goals of equalizing the people. In his recent speech, Modi says that the winners of the election 
were really the people of India. And that would be the case if he improved the relationship between two feuding communities, if along with implementing better public options for health care, education, sanitation, and digital literacy, he was able to decrease the fear within the Hindu community. The Hindutva was created to fight the British and empower the people of India. At this point, this includes members of the Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and Buddhist communities, and yes, the atheist, agnostic, secular, free-thinking ones as well. Hinduism is an open-minded religion, and silence towards this violence doesn't show that you're a good Hindu. Perhaps adding laws that restrict violence and persecution towards a specific group of worshippers could be a start. Modi seems like someone that really wants to do better by India, but has fallen into the traps of being a politician. Keeping silent on Muslim attacks and stoking the flames of terror that, that shows everybody that you're not for all Indians. It shows that you have the party's interest in mind over the people's well-being. The next five years of his rule are going to be dependent on whether he can put his party aside in order to pull India up to the world stage of progress and be a better Hindu as he does it. So where does this leave Tulsi Gabbard's connection? According to The Intercept, it has to do with the individual donors that are donating to her campaign. These donors, especially the ones that have given her large sums of money since she was first elected in Hawaii, belong to, a, belong to certain groups like Oversee friends of the BJP and Sang Parivar, which The Intercept has deemed as Hindu nationalist groups that believe in the same exclusionary ideologies as the Hindutvas. So let's take a look at some of these horrific principles these people stand for. According to their website, the overseas friends of the BJP say that therefore ensuring Indians in the media are portrayed accurately. And I really, really, really hope that they tried to get Big Bang Theory off the air. And and that and that's why that's why it's ending. Like like in a fantasy world in my head. It's like these these guys did it. They've they finally na- they finally put the nail in the coffin of that horrific, 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 awful CBS show. I really don't like that show. They also believe in integral humanism. Plus, they want to work on strengthening the bonds of the American Indians all across the, all across the world, despite of, of region, race, religion, creed, and color. I mean, I mean, how, how dare they? How dare they take the word friends and, 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 and take it really seriously, you know? And, and where's the part about the Hin, Hindu ethno states and cow worship? I mean, how can you worship statues of God we've never seen with words like humanism? It's like they're not even trying to sow the seeds of divide. I think the Intercept might be a little upset because the title of this organization sounds like the Indian reboot of of, of, of the Friends franchise, and it'll for sure for sure have a lot more minorities in it than its American counterpart. Song Parivar is a bit more complex. They do have ties with the RSS and the BJP, but the party itself is kind of like the libertarians of India. They have very liberal social ideologies, but don't like globalism. So it seems like these organizations and parties are vaguely connected they're they're kind of like offshoots of the central bjp but the main point being that these are still individuals that donated to her not the organization or the political parties look i'm sure bernie sanders has pro-jewish pro-israel donors but that doesn't make him anti-palestine and i'm sure Joe Biden has some black donors, but that doesn't mean that he likes black people. These particular individuals have said a few things that the Intercept article presents as nationalist. 
things like having a Hindu specific political organization like every other religion in America and not having the word Indian be replaced to South Asian. I mean, how dare they look for representation? Huh? How dare you? Now, look, I, I get it. Right. When you talk about the Indus Valley, the ac accurate geographic location is in South Asia. But it really depends on when in time you're talking about the region. And thanks to the partition of India and Pakistan by the Brits, we have to be really extra sensitive about where these invisible lines are drawn. You know, it's like talking about genders in certain state cases. You know, people are going to be very sensitive about it. You can't just willy nilly say that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're one gender or the other. You got to ask. You got to have questions. You got to be polite about it. Tulsi lost favor with some of these Hindu organizations when she dropped out of the World Hindu Congress in 2015. A lot of her individual donors that she had personally reached out to were furious and were said to decrease their contributions to her campaign. She had a letter that, uh, saying that the, the reason why she dropped out of the campaign was because there were complications with her participation of a Hindu partisan political event and after meeting with one of them a prominent member uh, in the Hindu community in America she clarified her position which healed some of the tensions within the American Hindu community and all this sounds like is that she builds relationships with some of the people that have donated to her and one of the troubling aspects of her record is that she voted against the house bill that would have America intervene in the Muslim violence in India. But she said there was a lot of fake information about those particular 2002 Gujarat attacks. Plus, she has interventionist policies. She's against, the, uh, against America intervening in other countries' policies. Right? Perhaps there's a, another way that we can make this happen, a diplomatic one. And maybe, maybe someone who has experience talking to more conservative Hindus can address the concerns on a world stage and meet with the leader of their party to resolve this violence amicably and peacefully. I feel like a lot of people in the Indian community are excited about Tulsi because we finally have a candidate in American politics that is culturally and ethnically connected to us that doesn't suck. After the major failures of Bobby Jindal, Ajit Pai, and Nikki Haley, we're losing faith that Indian people in politics can be decent people, that it doesn't just take Indian people into the machine and then just grinds them through it and then, and then just poops them out, making them pieces of shit. That's basically what, what f these former Indian people have been. I mean, Ajit Pai made an excuse for taking away net neutrality as you can buy shit on the internet. That's not what the internet's supposed to be for. Pi. Okay. It's. It's meant to be for a lot of things. Uh, I mean. It's mostly it's mostly for porn. But, but it, it can be used for a lot of things. But Til Tulsi proves all of these people wrong. Tulsi proves that you can be an Indian person. And jump into the American pol political machine. And still come out being a decent human being that's fucking exciting that's so exciting it's a positive representation of hinduism and its philosophies and it's come then this all of this by the way is coming from an agnostic that is highly critical of religion i have gone after religion my entire comedy career and I am saying that Tulsi Gabbard can possibly represent the philosophies of Hinduism in a positive light through what she says and through her policies. That's exciting. That's one of the most exciting things in politics right now. The Hindutva isn't how all Hindus practice their faith. Most Hindus want to be happy praying to their God of choice and for you to pray to yours and find a way to embolden each other's lives. The claims that, that she's a Hindu nationalist because she's a practicing Hindu demonizes all Hindus. 
It's the same tactic that's been used against Muslims in America for years. The accusers of Tulsi Gabbard unfortunately fall into the same category of hypocrisy that some of the members of the BJP fall into. You have the freedom to practice any religion in America and India, as long as that doesn't involve harming others in the name of some deity you haven't met, what difference does it make who you call God?